Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I begin, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. During the First World War, 619,636 Canadians enlisted with the Canadian Expeditionary Force and 424,000 shipped overseas. While the roles of soldiers at the Somme and Vimy Ridge are celebrated in Canadian history, there are many unsung heroes who may not have seen time on the front, but served a vital role in the Allied victory. Today, I'm looking at the Canadian Forestry Corps. And during this discussion about the Canadian Forestry Corps, I will be playing clips from my interview with Cameron Bartlett, who did a master's thesis on the Canadian Forestry Corps and was an excellent resource for this episode. And he helps lend a bit of information uh, related to the Corps that I think is really great. Very few people today know about the Canadian Forestry Corps, and while they served during the Second World War as well, I'm going to only focus on the First World War version. When the First World War began, and as it began to draw on, and people realized it was not going to be a quick affair, the need for huge quantities of wood quickly became apparent. Trenches used huge amounts of wood, including duckboards, shoring timbers, crates, and more. With so many British men serving in the army in France, there was a shortage of people available, and no one in the British Empire had more experience in harvesting timber than Canadians. At first, the plan was to have Canadian troops harvest the forests of Canada, which held huge amounts of timber, and then ship them overseas. The problem was that the merchant ships only had so much space, and rather than have timber take up room on those ships, it was decided that it was easier to bring the Canadians to Europe to harvest the timber of France and England. Another issue was the fact that U-boats were patrolling the waters, and there was a danger of a ship being sunk in the trip across the Atlantic Ocean. On February 16, 1916, British Colonial Secretary Andrew Law made a request to the Governor General of Canada to deploy lumber workers from Canada to cut and harvest timber. Millions of tons of lumber had moved across the Atlantic Ocean from Canada in 1915, but by 1916 the government was seeing it needed a new system. It was estimated that the first group of recruits needed to be 700 fellers, 450 sawers and assistant sawers, and 250 carters and haulers. When the, when the Forestry Corps is created, they begin, they primarily target uh, skilled lab, like skilled loggers, because when, when the Forestry Corps is approved, it, it, a, a request arrives in Ottawa in, I think it's February 16th, uh, 1916, or it might be February 26th, 1916. It's, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes with the differing sources between archival and other sources I found. And it's approved very quickly and they begin targeting and they begin recruiting, but they're looking for guys from the local logging camps. Cause at that time, Ottawa is still a big logging town. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where they're drawing a lot of the men from. And, that, and it's the same thing from the next two battalions, the 238th and the 242nd. They're recruiting primarily loggers. And eventually, they do start recruiting men who are not loggers, but they tend to, they tend to cull them from the ranks of base depots from amongst men who are who are of a lesser medical quality and everything. On February 25th, 1916, Major General Alexander McDougall, who was from Renfrew, Ontario, was put in charge as the commanding officer of the 224th Canadian Forestry Battalion. In April of 1916, the 224th Canadian Forestry Battalion, consisting of 1,600 men, would arrive in England to begin work. In addition, $250,000 in machinery was purchased in Canada to be used in Europe. On May 19, 1916, a request was sent to Ottawa for an additional 2,000 lumbermen who would be assigned to cutting down trees in France. Uh, well, basically the Forestry Corps during the First World War, it was what we would call 
a labor unit or a logistics unit. Basically, the general purpose of the Forestry Corps was to produce um, timber products that would be needed for the war effort. And these, the, the timber that they made, that they primarily harvested the timber and cut it for what would be, for what would be needed. But in some cases, they would just cut the timber and then send the, and then send those raw planks onwards to other, I guess, to factories and other air and other units who would cut it for their needs. For example, uh, the, the timber that was used in the, 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 the timber that was cut by the Forestry Corps was used for everything from uh, duck boards and uh, material to build the material to repair the trenches, you know, two by fours and everything to, uh, to timber used to create supply crates, uh, construction material to build telegraph pole, barbed wire stakes, uh, pit props, which were used, which were, which is the timber that you, you that you would use in uh, mines. You basically build a frame. When it, you, you know, if you've ever seen one of those old movies where they're crawling mm -hmm. around in like uh, an old abandoned mine, you always see there's a timber frame uh, supporting the roof, supporting mm -hmm. the roof of the mine. Yeah, that's a pit prop. Uh, firewood. Uh, the timber was used for rifles. It was used for artillery limbers, which was basically the, uh, which was basically the wood frame upon which an artillery gun was mounted. Usually, the smaller ones, 18-pounder field guns, and uh, other than that, they were used for railway ties because, in, to, to make a, uh, a to make a railway at that time, I'm not sure if it's if it's the same nowadays, but for every one point six kilometers of track or one mile of track, you needed 2,000 wooden sleepers. And usually you could, you could get a, you could get two wooden sleepers per oak tree because oak was the preferred, was the preferred uh, timber for that. It had good shock absorbing qualities and everything. So usually you could get two railway ties per oak tree. So imagine a thousand oak trees have to be cut down to lay 1.6 kilometers of track. In June, the Canadian Minister of Militia proposed to raise two new forestry battalions, each of a thousand men, which would be designated as the 238th and 242nd Forestry Battalions. In early November, the 230th Battalion was converted into a forestry battalion, but the need for wood was still so pressing that a request for another 2,000 woodsmen was put forward. On November 14, 1916, the Canadian Forestry Corps be formed officially. By the end of November, the War Office asked if the 119th and 156th Battalions might be made available to provide 2,000 men, while a further 5,000 men would be recruited from Canada, particularly from Quebec. Major General Sir R. E. W. Turner, the General Officer Commanding Canadian Forces in Great Britain, put forward a request on December 8, 1916, stating, Officers with the following technical qualifications will be permitted to transfer to the Canadian Forestry Corps. Actual experience in lumbering operations in its various branches. Logging, manufacturing, shipping, grading, etc. Also experience in the handling of men in construction work. Non-commissioned officers and men who have experience as millhands, logging foremen, SARs, flyers, saw hammerers, engineers, firemen, and all other branches of the lumber trade, felling, transport, manufacturing, and shipping of finished lumber. As soon as the Forestry Corps was formed, soldiers with timber harvesting experience suddenly found themselves diverted away from the front lines and put to work clearing trees for use by troops they had previously been serving with. These new troops were given coniferous tree cap badges that designated them part of the Forestry Corps, and they were shipped to spots in France, England, and Scotland to cut down trees, saw the wood, and have it ready to be transported to the front. This is the remarkable part. When approval for the creation of the Corps is given on the 28th of February, 1916, recruitment begins on the 1st of March. Recruitment is completed by the end of March. The first men leave at the beginning of April, and the first 
the sawmill and the sawmill is fully operational on the 13th of May, 1916. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's about 10 weeks between the first men walking, the first men recruited and the first saw and material passing through their sawmill. So it, it's a remarkable turnaround there. And by the time the Canadian, and by the end of that year, the Canadians have almost six to 8,000 men working in Britain. And then they begin moving them to France as well. They actually, struck that agreement in September of 16, though the Canadians were not too happy because of the French, because the French had, uh, they, they essentially, they, they logged in a scientific manner. They would only take what, they would only take a certain amount of the forest. And once they reached, and once you reach that uh, number, essentially, once you, once you, cut down your quota, you couldn't log for that forest anymore. So their moves were far more frequent than the ones in England where the British government just said, you see this wood, you can clear cut all of it and mm -hmm. then you move. So there, it, so in England, they're sitting there for like six, eight months in France, more, it would be probably, I don't know, four months between moves on average. <laughs> and they're all over France, they're, they're in Normandy, Northern France, the Jura Mountains near the Swiss border, and probably most, probably the best part, the best placement uh, down near the Mediterranean coast along the Pyrenees Mountains near the Spanish uh, French border. They, they probably had it best, you know, just no, probably like no snow, no nothing, no bad weather. <laughs> yeah, so they probably had it best. The other guys, they were all in England, they were spread out um, mm -hmm. all over England, except for Ireland. They didn't have any, they'd never made it to Ireland, though they did have plans if the war had gone on past 1918. In England, the Forestry Corps headquarters was at Windsor Great Park, near to Windsor Castle. And it was stated that one tree brought down by the soldiers was the William the Conqueror Oak, which was 38 feet in circumference and believed to be a thousand years old, dating to the time of William the Conqueror. King George V and Queen Mary would visit the detachment of the Forestry Corps on April 25, 1917 to see how the work was going in supplying timber for the front. The Times newspaper would write an article on the Canadians at Windsor, and in the article, dated July 10, 1916, called Yeomen of the Axe, it would state, The plantation, which forms part of the lands owned by the Crown and administered by the Commissioners of Wood and Forests, included a considerable area covered with spruce, fir, Scots pine, and larch. The lumber camp is all Canadian, men, machinery, and methods. The men who are drawn from all parts of the Dominion have the bronzed, healthy look and the easy, confident swing which we have learned to look for in Canadians. The khaki under their blue overalls proclaims them soldiers. They draw military pay, and they know the rudiments of military drill. But first, and last, they are woodsmen with their craft at their fingertips. In December of 1916, the forestry battalions were broken up to form the independent forestry companies, roughly 102 in all. On February 2, 1917, independent forestry companies were formed. Over the course of the war, thousands of Canadians served in the Forestry Corps, in dozens of companies, with each company composed of hundreds of troops. Interestingly, a lot of the members of the Forestry Corps were actually underage workers. They had enlisted by lying about their age, but were strongly suspected to be below the age of 19 and therefore not allowed to serve in combat. One group attached to the Forestry Corps were the New Brunswick No. 2 Construction Battalion, which was a battalion made up of black Canadians who served in the Forestry Corps beginning in early May of 1917. They were assigned to locations in France and were commended for their discipline and faithful service as part of the Forestry Corps. Yeah, the, suffice to say, the men of the num, of Number Two Construction Battalion were treated very, very poorly when they arrived with the uh, when they arrived for service with the Canadian Forestry Corps in uh, no, in uh, the summer of 1917 because they were they were sent to the Jura Mountains, uh, a region of France where it was uh, very that uh, about half the battalion found to be very unpleasant because of the fact that they that there were a number of recruits from Bermuda and the southern United States who come winter in a region with very harsh winters and just the 
conditions were awful. Many of these men were not used to it and there were very high rates of uh, pneumonia and other respiratory diseases, including tuberculosis and, li and likely later on Spanish flu amongst these men. And in fact, their commanding officer, he, he tried to do everything he could to alleviate their suffering, and, but he was repeatedly turned down. Uh, his requests for their transfer to Normandy were repeatedly turned down and just command had no no sympathy for their suffering. They, they were just told, you're staying where you are and you're doing the work where you are, though they were eventually transferred, but not until the, the, end, of, uh, the end of winter. So there was, a, there was a lot of suffering there for a period of time. Forestry workers tended to be far away from the front lines, but they were not free from danger. And some Forestry Corps units would be employed as labour units in the Canadian Corps on the front lines constructing rail and road systems and helping to evacuate the wounded. Accidents could happen at the lumber camps as well. Incidents with power saws, machinery, and even the transport of the wood could result in injuries. Each of the companies also had their own detention hospital, with six beds each. Sometimes the hard work itself would lead to casualties. Lieutenant C.W. Gamble of the 5th Battalion Canadian Forestry Corps was listed as a casualty because of chronic rheumatism which is a severe inflammation of the joints, and he was sent to England to recover and then eventually back to Canada. Some individuals died, including Captain J.R.N. McFarlane, although it's not stated how he died. Life in the Forestry Corps is described in the following letter from H.R. Summers Gill. He had enlisted in Saskatoon on July 1, 1916, and shipped over to England to work with the Labour Corps. Before being transferred to the Forestry Corps, he says... I journeyed to Whittingham, a small village in Northumberland, where we were to erect our first mill. The timber to be cut was growing on a steep crag about 1.5 miles from the village, and soon our wagons and lorries were cutting up the roads for miles around. We logged for over a year, and on December 21, 1917, moved 15 miles north to Chillingham and began operations on another stretch of timber on the estate of Lord Tankerville, the owner of the world-famous wild cattle herd. These animals were parked just a short distance from camp, and I saw a good deal of them. From the description I had heard of the cattle, I expected to see something along buffalo lines, but they were much smaller. In fact, the cows are smaller than a decent Holstein, though they make up for their size by being very hostile to strangers, as one of our boys found out when he came to and the doctor was stitching up his ribs. Things went along nicely until the armistice was signed when it was decided to demobilize the Forestry Corps and I can well remember the day when on November 20th our first draft for Canada left camp. Summersgill goes on to state that their unit produced 6 million feet of lumber using a 60 horsepower Canadian waterist mill and the average cut was 20,000 feet of lumber per day. The mill was moved four times and re-erected along with the building of railroads to ship the wood. He goes on to say in his letter, Our average company strength was between 100 and 150 other ranks with four officers. It must be remembered that 60% of these men were casualties from other units and therefore not in a fit condition to do a very hard day's work and stand the weather as A1 men would have. Though I personally doubt very much if men could have been found who could have tackled the job with greater success. Well, they were, they were pretty similar to what would have been found in, in Canada probably a little more civilized because logging practices in Canada differed. Uh, they, they differed from coast to coast. And I mean, for example, early on in BC, you know, mid 19th century, there's a lot of guys doing what's called hand logging, which is just, you know, just one or two guys cutting trees, uh, literally sliding them down hills, uh, taking them down to Vancouver. Then you have you know, the more organized logging camps that you would have found in, say, the Rockies, in, mm -hmm. East, in uh, Ontario, Quebec, and then in Nova Scotia. The, the logging camps are, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the logging camps are smaller. And usually the guys are only living there like six months of the year throughout the winter, doing their work then and everything, and then taking everything down spring melt through streams. So probably the conditions would have been similar to what they would have found in Ontario and Quebec which is more permanent year round logging camps. You have the men living in barracks. They have 
uh, in all honesty, more creature comforts than they kind of would have enjoyed in Canada in some camps. They've mm -hmm. got like canteens. Uh, they've got canteens, meal huts, access to uh, medical care and everything. They've, they've got a lot more than they probably would have had in Canada. And the, though the work would have been no less physically demanding, it would have been probably more demanding because in Canada, you're, you're beholden to your boss. And well, if your boss is, you know, cracking the whip, you can go on strike and fight for, you know, a reduced, like instead of a 12 hour shift, a 10 hour shift or eight mm -hmm. hour shift. But in the military, it's like, there were times where the demand was so high, camps were mandated to run 12 hour continuous shifts for months on end. So imagine just working for 12 hours in a sawmill, it just doesn't stop. That thing never, yeah. it, it never goes quiet. It's just, you're, you're on for 12 hours and you're off for 12 hours. And that's, that's how it might be for, I don't know, months at a time. It kind of differed. I mean, throughout 1917 with, uh, you've got repeated battles. You've got the, the campaign at Ross, which is where Vimy Ridge happens. And then you've got Hill 70 later on in, later on in the summer and then you've got uh passiondale as well which starts before hill 70 it starts in uh i believe august mm -hmm. 1st of 19 yeah not august 1st 1917 goes until november so there's a period where the forest people are just like go 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 as yep. fast as you can an example of casualties being assigned to the forestry division comes in the form of lb lafroy who was with the 1st Canadian Machine Gun Squadron in France and was wounded on May 24, 1915 at Festubert. I actually did an episode on Festubert several months ago, so check it out. He received the Distinguished Conduct Medal for bravery in the field. In 1917, he was again injured when a shell explosion caused him to be buried and he suffered severe leg injuries. After several months in the hospital, he was sent to Scotland to serve in the Canadian Forestry Corps. Many of the forestry camps in France were not far away from the front lines, as they needed to be available quickly to provide material at a particular point, and portable mills were often used. In one sighted transfer, a mill had finished with its last log at 9pm, and by 7am the next day, the mill had been moved to a new grove of timber three miles away, and was already up and running. The next day, that camp produced 18,000 feet of board, and then... 23,000 feet of board the next day. Eurogroup, one forestry company, had the largest output of anyone during the war. In one 10-hour period, they produced 156,000 feet of board. The most important contribution the Canadians made was their, uh, was their skill, was the fact that these men, that not a majority of them by the end of the war, because there's 25,000 of them by January of 1918, but the vast majority of the initial recruits, the men of the 224th, 238th, and 242nd, they're all skilled loggers. And these, so these men know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then they train, and then they pass on that knowledge to all of the recruits who start coming into the, to start coming into the, into the forest Corps. And so, so by the end of the war, the Canadians, are making a huge impact because of how efficient they are, because of how trained they are. Mm -hmm. Even though there are less of them than in, say, other labor units, because other labor units, there's many, 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 many more men. They're making an impact because of their skill. As the last 100 days of the war raged, and the push to gain land was moving at an accelerated pace, there were calls for troops from the Forestry Corps. In one request, 500 men were needed for infantry duty, and records show nearly 1,300 volunteered. The work of the Canadian Forestry Corps was highly appreciated in England. On April 12, 1918, the Right Honourable, the Earl of Derby, Secretary of State for War, wrote to Sir Edward Kemp, stating... I am writing this letter to let you know on behalf of His Majesty's government how warmly they appreciate the splendid work done by the Canadian Forestry Corps in connection with the urgent demand which was received early in February last for some 40,000 tons of timber to be sent to the front 
This was an unexpected demand, and it was requested that the delivery should be completed not later than the 31st of March. Shipment was commenced from the 10th of February, and the whole order was completed on the 20th of March, 11 days ahead of the specified time. Sir Douglas Haig would send a dispatch commending the Forestry Corps on December 25, 1917, stating, By September 1917, the Army had become particularly self-supporting as regards to timber, and during that active period of working, from May to October, over three-quarters of a million tons of timber were supplied for the use of the British Army. Included in this timber was material sufficient to construct over 350 miles of plank road and to provide sleepers for 1,500 miles of railway, besides great quantities of sawn timber for hutting and defences, and many thousand tons of round timber and fuel. The bulk of the fuel wood is being obtained from woods already devastated by artillery fire. The Americans were highly praiseful of the Canadian Forestry Corps as well, stating in various dispatches that, the Canadian Forestry Corps have repeatedly loaned equipment to the American forestry troops and have extended invitations to them to join in all of their sports and entertainment and have cooperated in the matter of policing nearby towns and in every manner assisted to the fullest extent. Another dispatch would say, The American forestry troops are also indebted to the Canadian Forestry Corps for the use of their machine shops to make repairs to broken parts of the American mills and for promptly furnishing lumber for building barracks on the arrival of the Americans at a time when it was most important that shelter be provided for the troops. He, like, there, there's, they, they received commendations from like multiple generals. I mean, they received commendations from the head of the RAF, from Sir Douglas Haig himself saying, you know, it was kind of a blanket statement to the support units after the Third Battle of Ypres, which we know as Passchendaele. And that was just a living hell. He's saying, like, thanks to our quarry units, our forestry units, our labor units, like, look, we're almost self-sufficient in everything. And, you know, like, thanks, guys, you're doing a great job. You know, it, it's, he puts it much better than I do. And uh, they're even given credit for helping defeat the U-boats because by harvesting all this timber overseas, you, you free up ships. Mm -hmm which were carrying that timber to carry more foodstuffs in it. And in fact, the Canadians, uh, it, it's estimated that their work freed up enough space on ships to feed 12 million women and children during the war. Wow. And I mean, that's a staggering amount. I'm not really sure what the tonnage would be, but it's just, that is staggering mm -hmm. that, without firing a shot in anger, they put a dent in the U-boat threat, mm -hmm. which was never, uh, it, was, it was never the, you know, the, the threat that it was made out to be, but it was still a, a considerable threat to the prosecution of the war. Canadian foresters didn't just cut wood for the trenches. The Royal Air Force was indebted to the Canadian Forestry Corps, not just for timber, but in their skill in construction. Many aerodromes in the United Kingdom were built by Canadians, with some corps working as much as 90 hours a week. There was a shortage of trained men, and for the aerodrome construction, you know, they needed men who were physically fit, who could do hard labour all day. The only men who turned out to be capable of that in England at the time were the Canadians. <laughs> so the Royal Corps, the predecessors to the Royal Air Force, uh, asked them if they would help construct some air homes in southwestern England, kind of uh, the Wait point up. that kind of uh, juts out towards a uh, point that's right under Calais, where Calais, Dunkirk, that area of France is. So they start building airfields there to try to help the British intercept the Zeppelins that are attacking England at the time. And then a year later in 1917, they do the same thing, but make the arrangement permanent, creating the creating number 56 district in England, whose job it is just to build aerodromes because the Germans came back the year later with uh, Gotha bombers, which were more effective than the Zeppelins. So the British had more airfields. They also needed airfields to train men because sadly, pilots' lives were often measured in hours or even days. So 
you, you could arrive at your unit and two days later, you could be dead. By the end of the First World War, it's estimated that 85,000 tons of round timber, 260 million board feet of lumber, and over 200,000 tons of fuel and slabs were harvested by the Forestry Corps. At that point, it was estimated that the Canadian Forestry Corps was made up of 31,447 people, with the majority being Canadians. In France, there were 425 Canadian Forestry Corps officers and 11,702 other ranks, while 5,021 prisoners of war in 13 companies were also part of the organization, and a further 1,100 individuals attached to the France companies. In the United Kingdom, there were 343 officers, 9,624 other ranks, along with 1,100 other individuals from England, Finland, and Portugal attached to the companies, along with 1,265 prisoners of war. Newfoundland fought as its own entity during the First World War, but they also had a role in the harvesting of timber for the war effort. The Newfoundland Forestry Battalion was formed on April 2, 1917, and an appeal was put out on April 4, 1917, stating that the Newfoundland Governor Sir Walter Davidson was calling for lumbermen and all skilled workmen not eligible for the regiment or the Royal Naval Reserve for service in the forests in the United Kingdom. In all, 500 men were recruited and the requirements to enlist in the Corps were more lax than the regular army. The call for volunteers also stated that no one shall be rejected for eyesight, flat feet, loss of fingers, or deafness. There were more than 500 men accepted, but 278 were rejected on medical grounds. As with the Canadian Forestry Corps, some members of the Newfoundland Forestry Battalion were teenagers too young to join the army, men who were medically unfit for regular service, and woodsmen too old to serve in the reserves. Other than two soldiers recruited in England, members of the battalion came from all over the island. A total of 167 came from St. John's, while 129 came from the Twillinggate district. Those 500 would clear 1,200 acres of timberland before the end of the war. The first 99 recruits would leave Newfoundland on May 19, 1917, with more troops coming at various intervals. The first group of woodsmen were sent to central Scotland, where they had to move logs, some as big as 50 feet long, down steep terrain. They couldn't build a railway in time, so they built a 900 meter long chute that moved the logs from the top to a pond at the bottom very quickly, and then the logs were floated to the sawmill. At the time, it was believed that the chute was the longest in the world. By January 1919, after clearing that 1,200 acres of wood, the Newfoundland forestry soldiers were being sent home. Today, a statue of a Newfoundland forester is at the National War Memorial in downtown St. John's. By the time the Forestry Corps disbanded in 1920, it was estimated as much as 70% of all the lumber that was used by the Allied forces had been harvested by the Canadian Forestry Corps. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at the Canadian Forestry Corps, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find hundreds of articles on Canada's history, as well as all my podcast episodes, on my website at canadaehx.com. And you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a day. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Information comes from Forestry Products Association of Canada, Canadian Soldiers, Newfoundland and Labrador in the First World War, Wikipedia, Sawdust Fusiliers, Canadian Black Battalion, the Medical Services, Letters from the Front, Five Strenuous Years, Strathconian, Report of the Ministry, McGill University at War, Nova Scotia's part in the Great War, and the War and the Future. Thanks, we'll see you again next time.